Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to session five of the International Testing Agency's webinars for anti-doping education. So we are on our final session here today. While people are still joining in, I will take a few minutes to go through some housekeeping, uh, some of the regular items that you may have seen and heard in previous sessions if you've joined us before. And then I will introduce our presenters for the day. So uh, you can talk to us through the public chat and I can see here already some messages coming through. Make sure that if you have any questions for the presenters, uh, you put them in the Q&A function, which is next to the chat. That way your questions do not get lost in the conversations. Uh, now, if you see any questions that you like, you can upvote them. We have a big audience with us today. So we may not be able to get through all the questions and that allows us to address the most relevant of the questions. Uh, we do have a big audience, so we may not be able to address all the, the queries. We will take those through education at ita.sport. If you want to connect with us after the session, we'll be happy to speak to you via email as well. So also note that, uh, just a note on the clarification of the privacy policy, some data was collected for registration, that is your name and your email address. So of course that is only used for the purposes of this webinar and to send you our slides and recordings afterwards. So definitely not for any marketing purposes. I will remind you at the end as well, but there will be a survey at the end of the webinar. We encourage you to give us your feedback so we can make our programs better uh, for all of the audiences that we're working with around the world. So we've already delivered a few sessions for you, uh, and those are available on our website, it.sport. You can see on your screen, uh, over the last two months, we've spoken about the anti-doping landscape, doping control process, principles, values, rights and responsibilities, and of course, medication supplements and the prohibited list. But this is our final session of, of the series. So we will be speaking about everything that is out of competition testing, which is a really big and important part of any um, anti-doping system. More specifically, we will speak about the registered testing pool, whereabouts, Adams, and the new Athlete Central. Also, this presentation will also be recorded and will also be available on our website. If you have any questions about uh, how the sessions are recorded, please feel free to contact us or to send a message in the chat. All right, so the format of today's session is quite interactive. It's a Q&A with our panelists who I will uh, present just in a second. And the presentation will be supported with a few slides so you can retain some of the important definitions and the key information from today's session. We will also have an activity and those of you that joined us two weeks ago for the medications webinar uh, will be familiar with it. So we encourage you to pay attention and to participate in the session alongside Mikel, whose knowledge I will be testing in a second. We will leave some time as always for the questions. So feel free to use the Q&A and we will address as many of the questions as we can at the end of the session. So without any further delay, I am going to introduce our panelists for today. Stuart Kemp, who is joining us bright and early from Montreal, is the Chief Operating Officer at the World Anti-Doping Agency. In his current role, Stuart contributes towards monitoring of code compliance and anti-doping program development. He's also responsible for the redevelopment of Adams, which is a very relevant experience to have for the session today. Previously, Stuart has been a member of the World Anti-Doping Code and International Standard for Testing and Investigations drafting teams. Throughout his career, Stuart has managed WADA's pre-games testing and was a member of numerous WADA independent observer and advisory programs. <clears throat> Prior to joining WADA, Stuart worked at the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Sport, which is uh, the NATO for the country of Canada. So welcome, Stuart. Thank you for being here with us today, bright and early. Thank you very much, Polly. It's nice to be here. We also have Matteo Valini, who is the head of testing at the International Agency. He has been with the ITA since its creation in 2018 and is in charge of the testing activities for both the international federations and major events. His career in anti-doping started over 14 years ago on the field as a doping control officer. He then joined CADF, the Cycling Anti-Doping Foundation in Switzerland 
and then a lead anti-doping activities provided by the doping free sport unit. For short, DFSU, which is actually the nucleus of the IT. He also chaired the Games Task Force and oversaw testing activities at the Winter Olympic Games in Pyeongchang, as well as uh, Youth Olympic Games, uh, or Winter Olympic Games in Pyeongchang and Youth Olympic Games in Buenos Aires, as well as just this winter here in Lausanne for the winter edition of Lausanne 2020. So uh, thanks for joining us, Matteo. Thank you, Olia. Thanks to everyone, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to, to all of you. And of course, last but not least, when we speak about any anti-doping topic, an athlete perspective is key to bringing theoretical concepts to life. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Mikel Thomas, three-time Olympian and national record holder in athletics, specializing in 110 meter hurdles, who has represented Trinidad and Tobago at the Olympic Games in 2008, 2012, and 2016. Off the track, Mikel served as community as a firefighter and an NCAA athletics coach in the US. He's in the process of completing a master's degree at the International Academy of Sport and Science, ASTS, and is also preparing to make his fourth Olympic Games appearance in Tokyo next summer. So throughout his athletic career, uh, Mikel has used Adams to provide whereabouts information and regularly undergoes in competition and out of competition uh, doping control. So very relevant experiences to speak about today. But uh, as you know from previous sessions, no athlete intro is quite complete without a good highlight reel. And we're going to take a minute to watch one for Mikel before we kick it off with all the important questions. This is my favorite intro of, of all the intros that we've done on these webinar sessions. So welcome, Mikael. Thanks for being here today. Good afternoon, good morning, good night, wherever you guys are. I'm uh, excited to be here. Excellent. So now that we're done with the housekeeping and the intros, let's get into the heart of this session. And I'm going to kick it off with a very general question for Stuart. If you can tell us, for somebody who perhaps is less familiar with the anti-doping system, but even those of us that work with it day to day, um, what is a registered testing pool? Well, thanks, Olya. Okay, so a registered testing pool, which gets often referred to as an RTP, because we just love acronyms in anti-doping, is the subset of athletes that need to provide a certain type of whereabouts information. So taking a step back, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of athletes that are subject to doping control, subject to education programs worldwide, but it's only a small group of athletes that need to provide whereabouts information. And the very top level of these athletes are the ones that are most subject to uh, out of competition testing. Uh, foremost, if an athlete's included in a registered testing pool, it's, it's almost a compliment because it means that you're the best of the best and that you're subject to out of competition testing uh, quite frequently. Uh, the RTP is the group of athletes that each anti-doping organization, be it a national agency or an international federation, decides that they're going to test most frequently. Um, no less than three times a year, 
athletes in an RTP are going to be tested. Um, and they're going to be tested for a series of factors and for a series of reasons, um, typically to do with the success of that athlete and more importantly, the risk of doping uh, for that athlete and the sport and the discipline that they participate in. So athletes in an RTP are those that need to be tested out of competition, which is typically the most effective type of testing. And if you want to conduct an effective out of competition test, then you need to know where the athlete is. And the only way you can do that is by collecting whereabouts information. So the RTP is the group of athletes from whom an anti-doping organization collects whereabouts information from to be able to support out of competition testing. Excellent. And I know you've already mentioned uh, how the athletes are being included. So generally we know uh, that if you, uh, it's almost from an athlete perspective is when you know you've made it when you're included in the RTP. But Matteo, from the ITA perspective, perhaps you can give us a, an angle as well, managing anti-doping um, programs for federations, how we are including athletes and based on what. Yes, so uh, the very uh, the very first step of um, any do any doping control program is to establish a, a risk assessment, and a risk assessment is also a requirement according to uh, to, to the World Anti Doping Code uh, that all uh, uh, international federations or national anti doping organization have to uh, to 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 do before um, implementing practically a doping control program. The, the risk assessment uh, identifies the, the actual risk uh, risks of doping in a sport and in the related disciplines and is developed by uh, the collection, uh, the combination and the processing of a broad variety of, uh, of data. So uh, just, just to give you an example, the risk assessment collects and combines uh, information related to uh, uh, the physiological aspects, the physiological risk uh, of a sports, uh, of a sport and the related disciplines, uh, the risk uh, of doping uh, in countries, and this is based on information such as uh, uh, doping history that uh, is available uh, uh, according to uh, to, to, to past uh, uh, statistics, uh, and is also based on the global uh, can also be based on the global corruption uh, index. And also, it also takes into account uh, testing history uh, worldwide and performance of, uh, of the, in the individual athletes. Uh, and for those athletes who are already uh, part of the system that are already been tested out of competition and have provided whereabouts information uh, in Adams or uh, another approved system, uh, this can also go into uh, the analysis uh, of the athlete biological passport uh, data and the whereabouts history uh, for uh, for those athletes. And so, the, the combination of all these elements um, will uh, results in, into a selection uh, of, of of a number of athletes uh, to be uh, who are more exposed to the risk of doping today and um, uh, will be included in either a registered testing pool as. Uh, uh, as Stuart uh, mentioned before, or a testing pool or other categories of, um, uh, of pools of international sports federations or uh, national anti-doping organizations. And then uh, the, the, all risk assessments are then translated into test distribution plans, uh, aiming at uh, testing athletes as efficiently as possible uh, and taking into account uh, uh, also other elements such as uh, the competition calendars of the, of, of the athletes, the, the performance variations uh, uh, of athletes uh, during the season, uh, injuries uh, as well, and, and, and other elements to, uh, uh, to basically uh, build, uh, make uh, an Intel profile uh, uh, of each case uh, and decide when a test, uh, when a test should, be, uh, should be implemented. Thank you, Matteo. Now, this has been mentioned a few times, and I was going to keep this question for a little later, but we are speaking about um, what's called the risk assessment. So athletes would be identified as highest risk. Now, does that mean, Stuart, if an athlete is included in the RTP, are they more likely to be doping? And vice versa, is an athlete who is not included in the RTP, are they less likely to be tested and or... Um, more like or less likely to be doping as well. 
Yeah, I'd say that just because you're in an RTP, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily more prone to doping. I think there's a lot of factors that help an anti-doping organization identify risk, as Mateo has pointed out. But really, when it comes to an RTP, it's about putting an athlete in the pool because you need uh, whereabouts information to find them. So let me give you an example. If you're a footballer or a soccer player, you might be tested as frequently as a cyclist, um, but it's easier to find a team sport player because you know where they typically train, you know their competition calendar, and so you may or may not need the level of detail that RTP uh, whereabouts warrants. So you can still be a high-risk athlete outside the RTP, but it may be that your anti-doping organization already is able to locate you for testing frequently, and so you don't need the whereabouts. The really important thing for RTP whereabouts is that it's only being collected to support out-of-competition testing, and it's a huge burden on an athlete to be able to provide their whereabouts every single day. And so, of course, the responsibility of the anti-doping organization is to be using that information regularly for testing so that the collection of that information is proportionate to the need to use it for testing. Thank you. Uh, and I guess a follow-up question then for you, Stuart, is what changes exactly for an athlete once they've been notified that they are now in a registered testing pool? What additional responsibilities do they have? Sure. Well, specifically, the responsibility is twofold. So there's a responsibility on the anti-doping organization to inform the athlete of exactly what's going to be required of them and to provide them proper education about what's required of them and the proper means to provide the information properly. Again, it's a big burden on an athlete. So there's really a big responsibility first on the ADO to provide the support to the athlete so that they're able to provide the information without making mistakes and so that it's relatively easy to do. On the other hand, for the athlete, the responsibility, it's also a big one. Now, obviously, elite level athletes take good care of themselves, whether it's nutrition or their physical health, uh, preparation for events. And part of that responsibility is also about complying with anti-doping regulations. So the specific responsibility for athletes once they're inducted into an RTP is to provide specific information 365 days a year. Now, whereabouts information and RTPs aren't meant to tie athletes down to being in a fixed location all the time. That's not practical. Um, RTP athletes in particular are top level elite athletes that are on the road constantly, maybe not these days, but regularly on the road these days, um, moving around in different hotels and so on. And that's why it's difficult for anti-doping organizations to find them for testing. So specifically what RTP athletes need to provide is every day they need to provide where they're sleeping at night so that generally an anti-doping organization can find them in the morning or find them in the evening if they need to test them out of competition. They need to provide what we call regular activities. So that's something like school or training or, or a job, uh, your employment, for example. And also they need to provide their competition calendar. So where they're going to be competing. And that information helps the anti-doping organization plan the tests in terms of the timing of the test to do an out of competition test relative to the period that's most at risk for doping relative to when they're training to compete for. And then the final element that they need to provide, which is most commonly heard about, is what we call this, the 60-minute time slot. So it's one 60-minute period every day that can be anywhere between 5 in the morning and 11 at night where the athlete can be found for testing. It doesn't mean that that's where the athlete will always be tested. All athletes are subject to testing 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. But we ask for one hour a day from an athlete where they can be found for testing. And the reason for that is twofold. If you know where an athlete is for one hour of the day, you know that they can't be generally too far from that 60 minute period the rest of the day. And if you have that comp complementary information, such as the regular activities, their overnight location, then doping control personnel can generally find the athlete. But the other part that's important about that is the 60 minute period is the one hour out of the 24 a day where the athlete's accountable for their whereabouts. So at that 60 minute period a day, Athletes, if they're not found at that location, which they have a responsibility to, to do, um, they could be liable for what we call a missed test or a whereabouts failure. And three of those in a 12-month period could lead to a violation. And the reason that's important is that one of the easier ways for a cheating athlete to avoid uh, testing positive is to avoid testing. And if you can't find an athlete to test them, that is a way that an athlete could cheat the system. So that's why we have whereabouts violations built into the system. 
Now, we don't ask that athletes are accountable 24 hours a day for their whereabouts. That would just be completely unreasonable. But the one hour a day is much more reasonable. And typically what we see is that athletes will put that 60-minute period first thing in the morning at home where they know they're going to be waking up. So the likelihood that they're going to be there is, is real or at the end of the day before they go to sleep so that there's less probability that they're not going to be where they say they are. So we, we try and adapt the rules over time and we try and provide the means to athletes to comply easily. But what's really important to anti-doping authorities is that we don't uh, facilitate a system that makes it easy for an athlete to make an administrative mistake. We don't want athletes to have whereabouts violations because they made a mistake or there was an error. Ultimately, we wanna make it easy for them to provide whereabouts so that we can protect their sport by ensuring that there's adequate at a competition testing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stuart. That was really well explained and I hope it was helpful to everyone who is listening in now. And uh, on that, and that's a very important point, Matteo, you, we are dealing, our team is dealing with whereabouts information day to day to day. So you see all kinds of entries. Um, and so do the athletes have to provide this information themselves and if not, is there someone else who can do it on behalf of the athlete? And whose responsibility is it ultimately? Yeah. So the submission of, uh, of whereabouts information is an obligation that each uh, registered testing pool or testing pool athlete has to uh, comply with. Uh, but it can also be delegated to, to a third party, such as, uh, for example, an agent, uh, coach, uh, team manager, or even to a family, family member. Uh, and that party has to agree with such a delegation, of course. Uh, however, it is important to note that uh, the responsibility for the whereabouts information provided uh, always remains with the athlete who has the obligation to make him or uh, herself available uh, and submit to testing and who is ultimately accountable for the whereabouts nonconformities that may be triggered by uh, inaccurate where whereabout entries. And so, uh, therefore, for example, an athlete uh, could not uh, avoid a whereabout failure by simply stating that uh, his whereabouts information were submitted by, by someone else. Uh, and whenever an athlete wishes to, uh, to make such, uh, such, such delegation to, to a third party, uh, the International Federation or uh, the National Anti-Doping Organization would normally require both parties uh, to sign uh, an official uh, delegation in writing uh, and then um, uh, access to, to, to Adams uh, would, or, or uh, other systems would, would be provided to, uh, uh, to the delegated person to provide uh, whereabouts information on, uh, on the athlete's behalf. Matteo, you've mentioned Adams, and uh, as someone who was new to anti-doping as an athlete, my first question was, who was Adams? And that was not the right question. So I will follow up with the right question, and that is, what is Adams? What is this acronym that we are referring to so often? Thank you, Olya. So uh, Adams uh, is indeed known uh, across the athletes community as, uh, as a database to submit uh, whereabouts information. Uh, however, uh, the Adams offers much more than just the collection of whereabouts, and uh, it is indeed uh, uh, a tool which enables uh, all stakeholders uh, involved in the uh, in the management uh, of um, of doping control activities to uh, uh, to be to be um, to be to, to be in connection with each other and. Um, uh, and, and liaise with, with each other by at the same time um, uh, respecting uh, the, the, the right access for, for, for each typology of users. So, for example, uh, Adams can be used by risk assessment experts uh, to pull out uh, all information required to, uh, to establish uh, the risk assessment. So when it comes to uh, uh, the level of testing across uh, a certain population of athletes uh, in, in a specific country, this is certainly uh, that type of data that can be pulled out from, uh, from Adams. It is used by uh, testing experts to, to plan, manage, uh, and follow up uh, with testing missions, and uh, as well as monitoring uh, athletes' whereabouts uh, uh, conformity. Uh, it is also used by laboratory 
by laboratories to uh, to upload the test results that uh, will then be uh, matched with doping control forms uh, corresponding to, to to a test which is carried out and to which uh, uh, international sports federations and national anti-doping organizations will also will also have access. Um, therapeutic use exemptions can can be uh, applied for uh, via Adams by by athletes uh, and and are also processed uh, via uh, via Adams by uh, anti-doping administrators. Uh, and finally, uh, it can also be used to um, uh, to, to process whereabout failures, uh, record the sanctions against uh, against athletes uh, when, when when applicable, and to manage the athlete biological uh, uh, passport. So, uh, and and then all this uh, this information is collected uh, via Adams uh, uh, by WADA. Uh, in order to monitor uh, the level of compliance of uh, of the World Anti-Doping Code of the various uh, signatories. We have a little bit of a background noise, apologize uh, for that. I know that Mikael is trying to join. Um, but uh, Stuart, how, how did Matteo do on, on answering uh, of that definition? <laughs> no, Matteo's response was very comprehensive. Um, I think what's important to highlight from what Matteo said is that Adams is much more than just, just whereabouts information. So the single largest group of users of uh, Adams are definitely athletes. Uh, at any given time, between 20 and 30,000 athletes worldwide are providing their whereabouts into Adams. Um, but they only see one small portion. They see the whereabouts module. Uh, but as Matteo mentioned, uh, more than two to 300 whereabouts, excuse me, laboratory staff around the world at WADA accredited and approved labs rely on Adams to fulfill their duties under the World Anti-Doping Code and the International Standard for Laboratories. You have athlete passport management units using the system. Um, and then, of course, anti-doping organizations who are planning testing on a regular basis. So it's, it's much more... Uh, it's much broader uh, than just the athlete side of it, and it's a, an essential tool if, if we're to have a coordinated fight against doping in sports so that IFs and NATOs and WADA can all work cooperatively. We need to be working from a single system so that we can share information and, in fairness to athletes, ensure that the work that we're doing is effective and efficient. Thank you, Stuart. I think Mikel is online on the phone. Let's just double check here. Yes, I'm here with you. Excellent. We saw you, so at least now we can hear you. I am going to come back to my questions here because there was a lot of uh, discussion about the athletes' responsibilities around being in the RTP, filling out whereabouts, and so on. So um, I'll start with, uh, you know, the first time that you were included in a registered testing pool or when you were notified, how did you feel about this additional responsibility um, and how did you deal with it as an athlete? I definitely was new to the idea. Um, having gone through sports through the NCAA system, there's more of a standardized approach to anti-doping where it's almost part of every athlete's responsibility. So at first you don't really know what to do because you have your coaches and your administrators pretty much walking you through the whole process. Once I entered into the professional realm, I kind of worked my way up that pyramid where I was in the standard testing pool at major sporting events. And then I was registered uh, as I improved in my performances up towards the national level where my training purposes in some major places had to be placed. And then again, I rose it kind of into the top five in my event to where I was then obligated to have at least an hour a day uh, regularly where I was able to say where I was what, and how I can be tested and things of that nature. So. I've kind of had to experience the whole dynamic where at one point in my career, I was being walked through anti-doping into another part of the career where I was more responsible to, for my role within anti-doping. And I think it's great that you received that experience. Too. Not a lot of athletes have the opportunity to receive that information before they're included in an RTP. Uh, so maybe for you it was a gradual onboarding until you've reached the 60-minute time slot there. Um, I'm going to ask you this question because I think it's very timely and appropriate in the world of athletics now, especially and in other sports. There have been many conversations about high profile athletes um, being sanctioned for for whereabouts failures. And Stuart, you've mentioned already that, of course, 
um, after three, you can receive an, an anti-doping rule violation if you miss three tests. Uh, so it is a way uh, for for athletes not to avoid testing um, and uh, not to get away with something if they were intentionally doping. So I'm going to ask you from a very practical perspective, Mikael, what did you do as an athlete? Uh, what are some of the practical tips maybe that you can share with the athletes and coaches who are listening to us? Um, not to miss a test, what can you do? Because it is a very big responsibility to be somewhere and available uh, every day and providing the whereabouts. Absolutely. Um, one is just understanding that it's an honor and a responsibility. Uh, once you become a professional athlete, you know, this is part of your job. It's just like how you take care of your body, you take care of your nutrition, you have to take care of your, your if you're part of the testing pool, that's just one of your obligations and your responsibility. It's not something that you pretty much being policed about. I think we have to change the perspective that, like mentioned earlier, it's almost like an honor to be a part of this testing pool. And you're now an ambassador for your sport and your country. So if you can see it in that purpose, there's more responsibility and honor in that process. But for me, it was a team effort, you know, because it's not just a bad test, it's not just a re result for me. It's my coach, it's my country, it's my sport. And so I had other people aware. Uh, I had alarms in my phones. Uh, that would have let me know uh, like nine o'clock the night before that I make sure I'm up to date with where I'm going to be the day after. Um, and then also making sure that I'm strategic about when I'm testing uh, or well, placing that hour window. Um, make sure it's a place and a time that you know you're going to be where you're going to be. So like when I leaned on my coaches, they always suggested early in the mornings where I know I'm going to be home. So like 5 a.m., 6 a.m., that window. You know, if you have to wake up to use the bathroom and you're being tested, it's a perfect opportunity to kind of kill two birds with one stone in a sense. So just also being wise about where you are. Um, I try to make it early mornings, late nights where I know I'm going to be home and I, I don't have to run the risk. But even that is text messages and things that you can change, even if it's on the fly. Um, I, talking to some of the old athletes in the past, it used to be one and you used to have to sit before a commission. I think we, we have to kind of not wait until you miss that first one before we actually start putting in preventative measures. We need to be a little bit more proactive in that. And it is getting easier and easier. We'll talk about Athlete Central in a minute as well. It is getting easier to, to provide that information. So, um, like I said, Matteo, you've seen many of these entries. Uh, is there anything else or even Stuart that you can add? What can athletes and coaches do to make it easier to um, take on this responsibility? Uh, I, w I, w I would say that uh, so today um, coaches uh, are playing a, a role w w which is key. Uh, they, they act as role model for their athletes. Uh, and so they also... Uh, uh, they, they also have to, um, uh, to, to, to help in, um, in spreading the uh, education messages towards athletes on how uh, whereabouts information can be, uh, can, uh, whereabouts obligation can be best uh, fulfilled. Uh, today there are, uh, WADA is, um, is publishing uh, courses, uh, anti-doping courses for, uh, for coaches as well. Uh, and so I would invite uh, all coaches and support personnel out there to to, to go through this uh, uh, through this uh, through this uh, coaching uh, e-learning tools and uh, and convey the message uh, to uh, to the athletes uh, to their to their own athletes. Anything for you, Stuart, to add to this, or it's pretty complete? Yeah, no, I, I would agree with Matteo that availing yourself of the educational resources that are there from your anti-doping organization is important. I also agree with Mikkel that it's important to have perspective on this issue that anti-doping authorities aren't after athletes with the whereabouts programs, quite the opposite. They're trying to support athletes uh, to be able to compete in clean competition, which means being able to conduct out of competition testing. So I think as much as possible, Athletes should try and provide as much detail as possible in their whereabouts submission so that it's easier to be found for testing and that the possibility of having an inadvertent missed test during that 60 minute period is actually reduced. Because if you're providing detailed information on where you're training and where you're living, that's generally speaking adequate to be able to help the anti-doping authorities find an athlete for testing. And it's really only 
when they can't find you at that location, either because the detail wasn't provided or because you weren't actually where you said you'd be, that that 60 minute period is gonna be used. So the more detail you can provide outside the 60 minute period, the less likely that an athlete's gonna incur a strike. So really just encourage athletes to provide as much detail as they can, recognizing that their whereabouts changes and there will be a need to change things over time as plans change. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I think it's very appropriate now that I test the audience's skills and uh, maybe Mikael too uh, on some of these whereabouts submissions. And I encourage everyone in the audience to participate using the chat. So the task for the next few minutes is very simple. Uh, I hope you are all paying attention and listening to the tips that Matteo, Stuart and Mikael have provided. I will show you a few case scenarios now and you can answer using the chat once again to see uh, if the submission that I'm showing you is accurate and complete. So I will kick it off with the first example here. Mikael, do I have you on the line? Just yep, gonna make I'm sure. Here. You're here, okay, good. So I will kick it off with the first case scenario. I'm gonna show you a submission in Adams and you let me know how that looks to you if, if this is satisfactory to our uh, standards. So here is an address entry for an athlete who is at a training camp. And so once again, everyone in the audience, if you're listening in, uh, you can tell us how this entry is, if it's accurate, if it's missing something. Uh, and uh, what do you think, Mikael, for this one? Mm. <laughs> uh, oops. Okay, but I would put a little bit more information in there. Mm -hmm. So I am going to see if we have, I know we have a slight delay, so maybe people are taking a little longer. Uh, but I'm going to show you the answer to, not the answer, but the better version of case scenario one. So we have the same entry, but uh, the exact address and a training call. So a lot of the time, uh, athletes are indeed filling out their information, but it's not enough. Uh, for somebody to identify exactly where they are. So if you look here in the first case scenario, there was no address and no additional information. And uh, here we can see the exact address of the venue. And if, let's say, they are training inside a, in this case, I just put Pierre de Coubertin Stadium because it's next door to our offices. We put training hall A, so we can actually find where that athlete is. Okay. Let's try another case scenario and see um, this one. So, Mikel, here we have, uh, of course, the athletes should be putting in their whereabouts uh, for traveling as well. So there's times that they will be in transit. And this is a travel mm -hmm. entry for somebody who is flying from Lausanne to Montreal, let's say, for a competition or a training camp. Yeah. I'm going to go with a no. I'm going to need more information. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, there's a few things on this one. Of course, you do need more information if you have a flight number or, you know, any kind of information about your travels. But also, uh, you see here athletes would be uh, not flying from Lausanne to Montreal from October 15 to Octo from October 1st to October 15th. Uh, they would indeed probably be in Montreal for that time, but they're only traveling for a couple of hours. So if we look at case scenario two being updated here, uh, we have the flight number, a few extra details that are always optional that you have a stopover, for example. But really, you arrive on October 2nd. So if you are updating your whereabouts, you should um, then have Montreal as your location from the 2nd to, to your time. Uh, there, let's say, ending on the 15th. And then you add another entry similar to this one for your return trip. So just a few extra tips for those of you who are working with athletes or who are athletes filling out this information. All right, we've got two more. So we've got a full calendar here that we filled out. Uh, the one stuff. Yes. So uh, what do you think about this one? How does it look to you, especially around that competition? Are you so, there or are you thinking? You're thinking, the, okay. I'm still here. In the sport of athletics, there's definitely some elements that are missing. Um, I guess this is a home competition, so there's no travel that's necessary. 
Um, so that's one. And then training in home, okay. It looks okay. Uh, a few things time. that we could do better. Uh, just a few things. So uh, here we can see that uh, somebody is adding a recurring event. So if you're always home in the evening, they just put that as every day of the week. And then training six days a week, let's say. Uh, but if they're traveling, those automated, automated recurrent events should probably be updated to being at a competition. So you can see the difference between case scenario three updated to this, like you said. Travel is a very good catch. So if they are in transit, they identify those days and three days at an event, uh, which means that if somebody was, um, if, if, let's say if, if the test was being planned, they would still use that 60 minute window identified here when in fact you're not home. So just important to update all that information for athletes. Okay, last one, but this one's hard. <laughs> uh, case scenario four, we zoom out. Uh, we have updated our World Cup, our training, our ground transportation. But then there's one thing missing here in the top left. That beautiful submission button. <laughs> yes. In fact, if you are using Adams, uh, you should be hitting submit, even if you have the full calendar updated, and that will just uh, make sure that your entries have been recorded. So that was just a little uh, activity to do with you, Mikael, to test uh, your knowledge of whereabouts submissions and to change the pace a little bit. And at this point, I am going to uh, turn it over to Stuart. But before I do, I want to say that it is getting easier to now um, submit your whereabouts for athletes. And recently, WADA has launched Athlete Central, the app that the athletes can now use. So you don't always have to go through uh, what would be considered a more complicated of a process through Adam. So you can do certain things on Athlete Central. So we're going to play a quick video uh, to introduce uh, this initiative and this app, and then we'll, we'll turn it over to Stuart to talk about it. The World Anti-Doping Agency, or WADA, is the international independent agency that's responsible for coordinating the fight against doping in sport. A key technology for WADA is what we call ADAMS. It's the Anti-Doping Administration and Management System. It's a global platform that all the stakeholders in anti-doping worldwide uh, rely on, and we're updating technology behind it so that we can improve the effectiveness and efficiency of all anti-doping activities, and in particular, those elements that athletes are involved in. Neuron is a boîte de technology design based in Montreal with des bureaux partout sur la planète. Il y avait une application qui existait déjà, euh, mais qui se devait d'être mise à jour. Euh, notre rôle pour euh, le développement de la nouvelle application a été vraiment d'accompagner WADA euh, sur la définition des besoins requis, design de l'expérience, design de l'application, développement et euh, livraison de l'application. Donc on a identifié euh, pas mal d'athlètes à travers le monde. Puis l'objectif c'était d'avoir leur feedback, comment est-ce qu'ils utilisaient euh, l'application, comment est-ce qu'ils rentraient leur whereabouts tout simplement, puis c'était quoi leurs enjeux, c'était quoi qui fonctionnait bien pour euh, être capable d'analyser les écarts entre euh, qu'est-ce qui était disponible aujourd'hui puis jusqu'où on devait aller pour faire en sorte que l'application soit la plus accessible, la plus facile à utiliser. Les différentes recherches nous ont permis de savoir ce dont ils avaient le plus besoin. En premier, ils ont besoin d'une application accessible. Ils sont souvent en déplacement, donc ils ont besoin de pouvoir mettre à jour leur whereabout rapidement. Aussi, une application facile à utiliser et facile à comprendre. Ensuite, ils ont aussi besoin d'une application intelligente. L'application a la capacité de réutiliser les anciennes informations qui ont été entrées d'utiliser la géolocalisation pour la création d'une nouvelle adresse ou bien de notifier l'athlète de toute information pertinente. We wanted to build on the equity of the WADA brand, but we wanted to use this as an opportunity to extend the WADA understanding to become uh, to be more approachable and athlete uh, focused. The routine of entering uh, your whereabouts daily can be uh, a demanding task, so our job was to make it uh, more fun and easy. Uh, this is why we created uh, a very uh, modern user interface 
uh, by using uh, light backgrounds uh, with a fresh color palette that is inspired by their whereabouts, like uh, blue sky for travel and uh, gold for uh, competition. Uh, we also use a set of custom iconography and rounded corners to complement the theme. Uh, we had to make sure that whatever we design can work in the th 20 languages that the app supports. But we hope that over time, Athlete Central can be used for athletes to collect information about the anti-doping process, to keep informed about new information and education that might be required, and to have access to their own information securely. In developing this new application, it's been key that we've listened to athletes, that we can build an application that ultimately meets their needs and addresses the way that they need to interact with the whereabouts system in real life. The Athlete Central application gives WADA the opportunity to showcase that we're in the digital age, that we're providing tools to athletes to comply with the whereabouts requirements that meet their expectations. We don't want anti-doping to be a burden for them. We want them to have it be easy to comply with the system and to engage with anti-doping. And we think that Athlete Central will be helpful in that regard. All right, that was a little introduction of Athlete Central. Stuart, do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Sure, let me try. So the system that you showed on the screen where Mikkel was testing his knowledge of whereabouts submissions, that's the traditional Adams module that's used by athletes on a laptop or on a desktop computer. Um, but of course, WADA and all anti-doping organizations recognize that athletes are on the move constantly and it's not realistic that they're tied to a computer all the time anytime they need to update their whereabouts information. So back in 2013, we introduced a mobile application that was only suitable for updating your whereabouts. So um, the detail that you need to provide needs to be provided on a quarterly basis. So every three months, all of your whereabouts for three months needs to be updated. And so an app that only does updating has certain limitations. So this past November, we introduced uh, at the Athlete Central app. And as hopefully you could get a sense from with that video, a lot of work went into it. Um, we worked with a local Montreal company to help us do a lot of research where we interviewed a number of athletes. We collected a lot of data from athletes on what they wanted in a mobile app and what they were looking for, and then tried to reflect that with this new app. Um, a lot too has changed since 2013 in terms of mobile technology and what we can put into an app. And so there's a lot of features in this app that we hope are gonna make it easier for athletes to provide their whereabouts information by using the type of technology that they're already used to using. So a couple of examples of that would be every time you provide a whereabouts location, that address is being stored in an address book like you would normally have in your phone for contacts, for example. So that means the next time that you're applying a particular location that you've used in the past, like a home address or a competition location, the app is smart enough to know what you're trying to say. So if you start to type Pierre de Coubertin Stadium, it will complete the entry for you. Another example is it uses uh, mapping technology, not to track your phone or to track you, but to be predictive in what you're trying to type. So let's say you're traveling to a competition and you're staying at a hotel, a brand name hotel, but you don't know the street address. Well, if you're in that hotel or near that hotel and you begin to type the name, it will find the location and the street address for you, like when you're using a mapping application if you're driving somewhere, for example. So trying to use that type of smart technology. The other limitation to the previous application was that it was only available in French and English. And now we're trying to make sure that the app is available in all of the languages that Adams is available in. So the desktop application for whereabouts is currently available in 20 languages. And since November, we've been working on translation with a bunch of partner anti-doping organizations to improve translation. And now Athlete Central is available in 14 languages, and that will continue to increase over time. So obviously the more languages that we can introduce into the system, the more likely it is an athlete's gonna use this app. And we hope that it's uh, gonna be well received by athletes because of course we want it to make it easier for them to provide their information. Another really important feature of the app, uh, you alluded earlier to a number of cases with whereabouts failures. We want to make it as easy as possible not to trip up. In other words, we want the system to be smart and to remind you about what you said where you said you were going to be. So if you look at the slide in front of you, for example, on the very first landing page, it tells you whether you've submitted everything accurately or not. 
And there's even a map that shows you where you've identified your next 60 minute time slot is. So with one click of the button, opening the app, you know what you've said you're going to, where you've said you're going to be. And there's even, even customizable notifications so that the, your phone itself can send you push notifications on a customizable basis to remind you of your 60 minute time slot. So you could set a daily reminder, for example, that let's say today's 60 minute time slot is going to be at 10 p.m. You could set that for a daily reoccurring reminder or you could customize it so that the reminder is only pushed to your phone at a specified time before it takes effect. So for example, if your time slot again is at 9 p.m., perhaps you customize it so that you get a heads up 15 minutes beforehand so it reminds you. So again, we're trying to use smartphone technology to make it easier for athletes to provide their whereabouts information, but making sure that we're not using the technology of the phone to do more than that. So the other benefit to this application is the security of it. Um, there's a, a robust login process, which includes two-factor authentication. If your phone has biometrics, you can use the thumbprint, the eye scan to get in and out quickly, which of course is much easier than logging onto your computer to do that. So the feedback to date has been really positive. I think athletes are appreciating that this is much easier to use. Um, as I mentioned before, there's anywhere between 20 and 30,000 30, athletes that provide whereabouts to Adams regularly. And before the introduction of this app, uh, we had no more than about 35% of athletes using the old updating app. And now we're approaching 50% even though that the app has only been available from November. So we hope that by quarter by quarter, there'll be an increased adoption of this app. And where we're going with this app is that the more athletes that are using the app, the more we can try and use the app as a means to engage athletes interactively. And so an example of that would be uh, because you have to come to the app, why not take that opportunity when you have the eyeballs of the athlete in the app to provide them educational resources, for example, or quick links to information about how to apply for a therapeutic use exemption or information about how to contact their anti-doping organization and so on. So for lack of a better term, the second you've got athletes' attention through the app, you have this captive audience and you have this means to interact with athletes. And we'd like to try and use that technology to make sure that we're supporting athletes even further. So not just collecting their whereabouts, but also collecting their feedback about what they'd like to see improved in the anti-doping ecosystem and how we can provide them resources in multiple languages. Thank you, Stuart. Now, uh, uh, Mikael, you said reminders on your phone and just making sure that you don't forget where your 60 minute time slot is. I'm not sure if you've had any interaction with this app, but uh, from your perspective as an athlete, I guess this would make life much easier, no? It definitely would help because there's been times where I forgot where certain venues would be or I didn't know where the hotel information are. So having like the mapping feature is like really cool to get the accuracy that's needed to be able to, again, comply with the whole process. And you're talking about meeting the athletes where they are. More people are going to be on their phones and they're going to sit down and actually fill out these things on, on a tablet or a computer. And so it's the opportunity because, again, life happens. If you forgot that you were supposed to be there, that you have a mobile device to remind you that, hey, you set an appointment for this particular time. You should be in this particular location. Um, and so it, it hopefully could help minimize some of those mistakes that happen because I, I don't think anyone – intentionally is trying to miss the mistake but we need to make this more of a, a natural process of, of the day-to-day -day. you know you, you drink water because you know you need to in order to perform same thing you're kind of obligated to perform in this regard it just has to become normalized in this process it's, it's the only hard part is you know sometimes like in my career you go from not being in the pool to being in the pool so there has to be ways where it's almost like a standard practice that you know that when you become this elite athlete, that part of the job of being an elite athlete is your obligation to, to fill out these things. And there's, of course, we, we often come back and during these sessions to education and sometimes lack of information or need for more information. So certainly uh, there is a big onboarding process for athletes um, joining the RTP or any testing pool in general. 
Uh, but this should make it easier to at least uh, satisfy that requirement of being a high performance athlete. So thank you, Stuart, for that uh, overview. And I hope people listening in, I know that people were asking for the app name as well. We put it in the chat. So we encourage you, if you're working with athletes or if you are an athlete, uh, to get familiar with this app. Now, uh, before we move on to the audience questions, and I see quite a few in the Q&A, I'm going to wrap it up with, with final questions for each of our panelists, and then, and then we go to audience questions. So I guess, what is your vision now? The, the big bulk of work and the big focus was the app. Now, what is, what is the future of out-of-competition testing, and what are the water priorities? Well, that's a big question. So I think I'll maybe just start with uh, what we hope to achieve with Athlete Central. Um, I think, as I've already mentioned, uh, we want to make it easier for athletes to comply with the whereabouts regulations using technology. So I think the next step is to sort of live up to the name of this application. We don't call it a whereabouts app. We're calling it Athlete Central because we hope that over time it's going to become a central hub for athletes uh, to provide information to anti-doping authorities, but also receive information from anti-doping authorities. I don't think a lot of athletes are spending time perusing the website of WADA and other anti-doping authorities, but if they're going to be in this app anyway, and we can provide information to them, uh, I think that's probably more achievable, more realistic. So what we're going to be doing now is looking to engage athletes to understand how else this app might help them. So some examples, some concrete examples would be uh, WADA is now finalizing a new paperless doping control system so that when athletes are tested, they're done so uh, through a tablet rather than through carbon copy paper forms, for example. And over time, what we'd like to see is that athletes, instead of having a paper record of their doping control, would use Athlete Central to access their testing records. Um, I think a lot of athletes that are advocates for clean sport want to be able to demonstrate that they're clean. They want to be proud of the fact that they're tested regularly. And Athlete Central could be a means to show that off, that they could say exactly, I've been tested X number of times by my IF, Y number of times by my NATO, here are the dates I've been tested, so that there's greater transparency over the anti-doping programs and athletes can have greater ownership over that information. So securely accessing testing records would be one example. Um, another example would be perhaps that over time, athletes could provide the medication and supplement information that they take through this tool that could be connected to the paperless tool. So that at the time of testing, athletes wouldn't necessarily need to itemize everything that they're taking because they've already provided it through this app. Now, these are just examples. These aren't concrete things that will necessarily be done. We're going to be working with anti-doping organizations and athletes to see how best to leverage the technology. But in terms Olya, of your question of where are we going with out of competition testing, what is WADA looking to do with this app? It's certainly to try and leverage technology uh, to make anti-doping more accessible for athletes and to make the broader system uh, more efficient going forward. Excellent, thank you, Stuart. Uh, Matteo, is there anything you'd like to add on the future of, of out of competition testing from, from the IT perspective? Yeah, uh, Olya, so, uh, in, in terms of testing, uh, it, it is difficult to predict the, the, the short uh, and medium term uh, scenario in, due, due, to, the, uh, to, due to, to the ongoing uh, pandemic, which is affecting uh, uh, several parts of the society uh, globally. Uh, having said that, the, the ITA is continuing to, to increase its effort in, uh, in innovation, technology, and all other uh, fundamental uh, elements uh, of, of anti-doping programs. Um, for, from a testing perspective, as, as I said before, uh, so testing needs to be uh, as effective uh, as possible, and therefore we need, we need to be able to, to, to to, to plan tests uh, at the best time and at the best place. And so one of the, the goals is certainly to, uh, to increase efforts in the field, in the field of uh, collection and processing of intelligence data for the better targeting uh, of the athletes. And the ITA today is well positioned in terms of uh, uh, Intel data collection and processing in light uh, of its role, of the role it has across uh, the different sports. Uh, and this should ideally uh, evolve alongside with other major projects that uh, not only the ITA, but the, the entire anti-doping community 
uh, with WADA is working on. Uh, one of these uh, could be the, the, the integration of, um, uh, of the endocrine modules and uh, one day the, the athlete performance, uh, performance module into the existing uh, athlete biological passport. Uh, and other than uh, other than that, the, the way forward is also pretty much defined by uh, uh, by the adoption of the of the new code of the 2021 uh, code, uh, and we are currently supporting uh, international sports federations to uh, uh, to um, uh, in, in the in, in the drafting of the of the new rules. Thank you, Matteo, and I think that's a good reminder because we spoke about really the athlete facing side. Uh, of the system, so the app and what they need to do, but there's also um, uh, the whole uh, complicated structure in the back that uh, we briefly described, and I, I, I hope that for the audience, uh, we were able to give a short preview of really how the system functions and where we're trying to uh, focus our energy and our priorities. Uh, of course, I will finish with an athlete question uh, as always, for that athlete perspective, um, what do you see as an athlete in the future? Um, what works well now, Mikel, and what would you like to see improved uh, in in out of competition anti doping system? I love the wordage on the idea of this becoming something that is athlete central. I think if we can bring more athletes and experience around anti doping or clean sport at an earlier age in their career. Just like one of the first things I was ever told was to download the water list, um, just to have it so you know. If there was somehow a way, maybe you could unlock levels based off your performance later on in the career, but somewhere that you can start influences and in making this again a normal seat of anti doping, whether it's gaining the resources that you need, being able to sync up when you have certain education activities or being able to receive certain education. Um, just having something that is really a centralized hub, that if a youth athlete or an experienced athlete could start getting used to being engaged in this platform, I think that would help. So that when the time comes where you are now at a greater responsibility than before, that you are already familiar with this platform, already familiar with the idea, because that's, what's been a problem with a lot of athletes that I've talked to is the idea that they literally go from one point to another point and they weren't prepared in a sense to, to bridge that gap. And so I, I just want to see this become more of a everyday thing and rather than only at the elite uh, where it becomes so separatist that some people are just not ready uh, to make some of those transitions. So the more we can make this an everyday thing, um, I think the better people would feel around the process. Because again, like he mentioned, Stuart mentioned, it's, it's, it's an honor to be able to be an ambassador for your sport. And this is just part of the duties that you can do by just making sure that you're showing what clean sport can do. And if we can all play a role in that and be activated in that experience, I think more athletes will be inclined to be able to make the proper transitions and do what they need to do to move sport forward. Of course. And this is why I gave the last word to you, Mikael, because you wrapped it up so well. Um, okay, so let's take a few minutes now. We have about 20 minutes to address some of the questions from the audience. Uh, and I'm going to read them out and let you, Matteo or Stuart, uh, take this question. Uh, I'm not sure who is the best one to answer, so I will let you decide. Uh, the first question we have is from Michelle. Is there a responsibility on the ADO to ensure that athlete has consented to be part of the RTP in order to agree to additional processing of personal sensitive data and additional obligations of whereabouts? And that this should follow the mandatory education as described as in introduction or induction. Isn't this an athlete right? I'll, I'll field that one. Um, hi, Michelle, thanks for your question. Um, so yes, absolutely, it's uh, an athlete's right to be informed of their responsibilities and their rights within the process. Um, and consent, as you know, is built into the anti-doping rules so that athletes are aware of how the information that they submit is going to be processed, whether that's whereabouts information, TUE information, or the information they provide at the time of testing. 
So there's different ways of collecting that consent, but when it comes to atoms, there's a very clear process uh, where athletes sign an agreement and are made fully aware of how their information is gonna be used, how it's going to be shared. And in fact, there is a full international standard that WADA publishes so that it's mandatory for all anti-doping organizations to respect a basic requirement around the disclosure of information. And that's what we call the International Standard for Privacy and Protection of Personal Information. Given that privacy standards around the world vary, uh, the anti-doping system is making sure that there's a common standard in place. Um, and so in certain countries, they may go above and beyond this privacy standard, but WADA and the World Anti-Doping uh, Code ensure that there's a basic uniform approach around the world that certainly protects athletes' information and consent is a big piece of that. Excellent, thank you, Stuart. A question from Sarah now. Will more testing be done at Oh, it disappeared. There you go. Will more testing be done after countries have come out of lockdown for COVID? If an athlete was inclined to cheat, this is the optimum time to do so, as no testing is able to take place in many countries right now. Ahead of an Olympic Games, this is a big concern for me that I will on that I will be on an even more unfair playing field as a clean athlete, while others are using this time to their advantage. Um. I can take that. Uh, so, of course, uh, testing efforts will uh, will strongly uh, increase with the reopening of the countries, and even during uh, the, the the period of the pandemic, we have still managed to perform a uh, limited number of tests uh, on cr critical tests uh, whenever and wherever we, we could. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to the Olympics. Um, uh, so on the ITA side, uh, we we are adopting the the, the pre-games expert group um, uh, approach, uh, and so uh, an expert group composed by uh, five NADOs and five international federations uh, experts uh, will basically uh, carry out uh, a global risk assessment uh, across all sports, uh, all countries to reevaluate uh, uh, where the gaps uh, uh, of the system are that there will cert certainly be uh, uh, gaps uh, as, as you as you correctly mentioned uh, but this th this exercise will uh, will help us to uh, to identify where uh, where the shortfalls are and uh, and therefore to focus uh, uh, and therefore where we we have to focus uh, testing efforts Maybe if I could add one point too, Olya. Um, the, it's absolutely true that there's been a reduction in testing during this period. And of course, that's been the case because it's been important to prioritize the health of athletes and sample collection personnel during this time. But I wouldn't say that that necessarily means that it's a free for all for doping during this period. Uh, one of the really important tools that anti-doping organizations have is what we refer to as the athlete biological passport. And rather than just looking for the presence of a particular substance in an athlete system, the passport monitors markers of the use of substances over time. So what we can actually find is as countries and athletes are deconfining, if they have dope during this period, that can also be revealed through the Athlete Biological Passport Program. Um, so it hasn't been a free for all during this period. And as Matteo rightly says, anti-doping organizations are collecting information and intelligence during this period so that they can be more targeted uh, as testing resumes. Thank you. Thank you both, Matteo and Stuart. Uh, I apologize if I mispronounced the name. A question from King Ping. Some IFs give instructions to their RTP pool athletes that they should only submit the one hour suggested for testing. What should NATO suggest to the same athletes in the RTP pool? Um, maybe I'll, I'll take that one as well. And, and then Stuart, uh, you, you can ship in. Um, so although an athlete may be included uh, in an international federation and in a NADO uh, registered testing pool, uh, it is the whereabouts custodianship of, the, of that athlete that basically sets the, the requirements according to which uh, whereabouts information have to be submitted. So there is one whereabouts custodianship uh, that basically uh, requires the athlete to, uh, to, to comply with, with, with certain criteria. Uh, and then the other organization, either the NAD or the IF, should, uh, will be aligned with, uh, uh, with those criteria, which uh, in any case uh, are, um, uh, are in compliance with the World Anti-Doping Code. 
Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to Mateo, only that if an athlete is in an RTP, then the whereabouts information they have to provide is very specific, and it's more than a 60-minute period alone. Um, and so certainly the NATO and the IF should be aligned in what they're requiring of an athlete if they're in an RTP. Thank you. Another follow-up question from the same listener. It happens that urgent things occur, whereabouts information need to be changed as soon as possible. And uh, while athletes cannot log in on Adams due to te technical difficulties, uh, what can be done? Yeah, I'll take that. Just in general terms, obviously, that's precisely one of the reasons that we're introducing this new app to make it easier. But there's always going to be reasons of technology where it's not working. Mikkel right now is case in point. We all have the best intentions, and sometimes Wi-Fi might let us down. Sometimes the network is down, and so on. Life happens. Um, and in those cases, if an athlete can't provide an update to their whereabouts for unforeseen reasons, they just need to provide the reason that that happened. That's all. There's, uh, there's fairness in the due process that are afforded to athletes. Should they incur a whereabouts violation, they have the opportunity to explain what happened, and provided it's a reasonable explanation with the proper evidence or information, then that would be excused. But again, there's a results management in, uh, process in place to handle that. We want to make it as easy as possible for athletes, but sometimes technology can let us down. Uh, and in those cases, athletes will be afforded the opportunity to explain the situation. Uh, maybe I can also contribute to, to that one, uh, to, this, to this question by saying that uh, uh, so whenever athletes encounter uh, uh, technical uh, difficulties, uh, they, we, we, of course, invite them to, to contact us as soon as possible. Uh, and we have a team um, here dedicated uh, to, uh, to, to supporting uh, athletes uh, in their uh, IT, IT endeavors. Uh, and then finally, also, if, if Adams is not working uh, uh, for whichever IT uh, issues you may have, uh, then uh, please send us an email. Uh, emails today uh, are accessible via various devices, uh, smartphones, laptops, uh, iPads, and so on. Uh, and so uh, if we know that uh, you're, you're facing uh, issues, then uh, we, can, we can get in, in, in touch with you uh, quickly and help you to solve these issues. I think the overarching theme here is that um, all of us are working in anti-doping and trying to support the athletes. So the system, and we've said it earlier in this webinar, uh, it is a, a difficult system to navigate, but we're really trying to help the athletes as much as we can, whether on my end, I'm doing it through education, or uh, Stuart is developing the app that will help the athletes make it easier to submit their whereabouts. So um, it's it's really about showing your effort to, uh, to follow the process. So if it's an email to ITA or to your sport federation saying, I'm having some trouble, and you happen to be um, receiving a test attempt that day and you miss it, you have the email or you have that proof that you're saying, hey, I'm having trouble. So that is just uh, like Stuart was saying, would be your a reasonable explanation as to why you missed the test. So all of those things help, not just to ignore the situation, but say, hey, I really tried to do something and it didn't work. Uh, I will move on to a question from John, who is asking if an athlete is only willing to test before a major games, but not willing uh, to, to I guess, provide whereabouts. Is there any implication? And I, I think we can talk about the well. Uh, maybe, maybe there. Maybe maybe I will take that. So, uh, irrespective of whether an athlete is uh, is taking part to a major games, uh, major event or not, uh, it is really not a, a decision uh, of the athlete to either take part to a, to a whereabouts program or not. If, as a result of uh, as the result as a result of the of the risk assessment, it has been identified that an athlete should be. Uh, uh, included in either uh, the NADO or the International Federations pool, uh, then uh, this basically sets uh, the, the rule of the game. If you want to um, uh, to to to, par to participate, uh, then um, you have an obligation to provide uh, whereabouts information and uh, and submit to the to the uh, to uh, to doping controls. Okay, thank you, Matteo. Question from Fatima. How often are athletes required to update their whereabouts? So I'll take that one. So as I mentioned before, athletes meet in an RTP have to provide whereabouts for every day that they're included in the RTP. 
and that RTP is typically reevaluated every quarter. Um, but the updates that are required depend on how frequently you update your movements. Uh, so for example, if an athlete is providing a quarterly submission, that's 90 days of whereabouts. And I don't know about you, but I don't know where I'm going to be exactly 90 days from now. Um, so what you do at the beginning of the quarter is that you provide the best information possible, and then you change it as much as necessary. So if I know that I'm going to be competing in a competition three months from now, I might put that in my calendar that there'll be a competition. But if I don't know the hotel that I'm going to be staying at, at the competition, I can't update it until it takes, until I'm aware of that location. So the responsibility of an athlete is to update it as soon as they know there will be a change. So as soon as I get that hotel information, it should be added. Because we have to remember that the, the whole purpose of whereabouts is for anti-doping organizations to be able to conduct out of competition testing. And if an athlete only updates their information moments before it happens, it becomes very difficult for an anti-doping organization to plan a test. It's not as simple as just showing up. Anti-doping organizations have to task a doping control officer to travel to a location to test an athlete. They have to see that that doping control officer is available at that time to conduct the test. So the more advanced notice anti-doping authorities have, the more effective and efficient the test will be. But we balance that with the reality that athletes' movements change, and so they need to be able to update it right until the moment it takes effect if there's a change in plans. Um, now, anti-doping organizations also monitor how frequently athletes are updating their whereabouts to make sure that they're not abusing that system. So for example, if an athlete is constantly making last minute updates to their whereabouts, that could be indicative that the athlete is trying to evade testing. So we ask in good faith that athletes update their information as soon as they're aware of a change. Thank you, Stuart. I uh, will move on to a question from Patricia uh, on whereabouts. If I drive for three, four hours to an appointment, which is away from home, but I won't be at the appointment, but I won't be at the appointment for an hour, only half an hour. How should I enter it in Adams? Is a comment enough? Should I enter the location of the appointment with a comment? So I like the detailed questions because already I think, uh, and I'm assuming it's an athlete, is already quite familiar with, with Adams and Athlete Central. Is it your yeah. turn, Matteo? You... No, I think, I mean, I, I, I think that th this question um, uh, is, is partly answered uh, by, by your explanation uh, that, that you provided before, uh, Stuart. So uh, as, as soon as, as an athlete uh, uh, notices that uh, there may be a change in his or her whereabouts information, then uh, this should be updated in Adams uh, uh, right away. So uh, um, I, I don't have much to, to, to add to what you said before. Maybe one point of clarification I think is that if an athlete's traveling, let's say, three hours for a particular appointment, they don't necessarily need to provide that information. Um, if it's not a regular activity, if it's not a competition, it's not a 60-minute location, but rather you're going to drive three hours to visit your grandmother, you don't need to provide that information to the anti-doping authorities unless it conflicts, it overlaps with one of those other requirements. Because the second we start to require that information, we're building a 24-7 accountability system on athletes, which is completely impractical uh, and unrealistic. So my direct answer to the question would be that it depends. So you only need to provide that travel information if it overlaps with the existing requirements that we already talked about. Thank you. And uh, also, I think providing any comments, if you feel like you do uh, have a full day of travel and you just want to be, you know, better safe than sorry. So if you want to add additional information saying, I'm going to have an hour appointment and you, you do put that into the system, that's definitely not going to hurt. So any details help. For a uh, uh, question from Martin now from... Uh, Fitek, uh, would the whereabouts issue be solved by using location tracking and apps? That way, even those athletes that do not fill in the chart properly or completely would still be quote unquote found. All right, so I'll field this one if you don't mind, Mateo, because we, we get this question a lot. I don't. <laughs> um, so we get this question a lot. And really the question is, why can't you just use the technology on my phone to track me so that I don't have to provide inf information? And it really comes back to the earlier question from Michelle about uh, consent and about privacy. Um, 
There are three main reasons why we don't do this. Uh, the, the, the primary reason is athlete privacy. There is no reason for anti-doping organizations to be tracking athletes 24 hours a day, seven days a week on your phone. We don't need to know where you are. It's not reasonable, and in many cases, it wouldn't be lawful. We only need information that's proportionate to our needs for testing. Um, from an athlete perspective, uh, I don't think it would be as much fun as an athlete might think because your battery would die pretty quickly on your phone too if you're being tracked all the time. Uh, the third reason, beyond those really important privacy reasons, um, have to do with the planning of tests. I mentioned earlier that we need whereabouts in advance so that we can plan tests, but it's difficult to test somebody who's constantly moving. If you're a red dot on a screen, we'd be chasing you to try and find you constantly. So it's actually really important that we uh, have the ability to plan ahead because not all tests are created equally. Um, a lot of doping substances, they clear an athlete system very quickly and there's a limited window of detection. And that's why we need whereabouts so that we can plan tests at the right time. But again, most importantly, it's around privacy considerations. There's, we can understand why athletes would like to make it easier uh, just by having us follow a phone, uh, but for privacy reasons, it's, it's really not something that anti-doping organizations are interested in. Thank you. We were anticipating that question as well. Uh, I see Eric here, uh, the question about organizing. Thank you for the kind words, Eric, on the webinars. Uh, and just, a, I guess, um, question asking if we are going to be organizing more. Um, we are at the end of almost a pilot series that we launched for the unique circumstances of uh, the pandemic. So um, we will take all of you, and this is why the survey answers are so important to us, is we will be evaluating all of your feedback, what we can improve, uh, where we fit in uh, with the information that we share, because you can see that there are so many other organizations, WADA is running a series of webinars, um, a lot of other organizations are delivering information digitally, so we will evaluate and see where we sit and where we can best fill the gap. Um, for those of you that have asked about languages as well, we are looking at ways to make this more accessible, uh, maybe beyond English as well, to deliver webinars in other languages. So please stay tuned. Uh, we will, If we do more, and I hope we do more sessions, we will communicate that on ita.sport. And... Uh, if you have any specific questions, once again, education at ita.sport is the email address to reach at reach us. Uh, so once again, thank you, Eric. I'm gonna, we have six minutes left, so I think we can do maybe two more questions. Um, and I will go to Giovanna next. Is there a formal communication to an athlete notifying him or her that she's part of the RTP or TP? And consequently, is there is the athlete also notified if excluded from the testing pool? Um, yes, I, I will take that. Uh, indeed, Giovanna, you are uh, you, you are right. Uh, athletes are uh, notified about uh, inclusions and exclusions from uh, from registered testing pool and testing pools. Uh, in the letter of inclusions, they are informed uh, about their responsibilities, obligations, uh, but also consequences should the uh, whereabout requirements not be uh, fulfilled uh, and are also um, uh, informed uh, on how the data, uh, their personal data will be treated uh, in, uh, when, uh, when, when, it, when um, whereabouts information are provided via Adams. Uh, and uh, uh, indeed also um, uh, instructions uh, and uh, educational videos on how to use Adams are provided in the same, uh, uh, in the same notification. Uh, and so the, the, the letter of inclusion is a, is, is a very detailed uh, uh, document uh, we, which sometimes uh, athletes uh, um, uh, read very, very, very quickly. And, and so I think it's important that from, from, from an athlete's uh, perspective, uh, when they receive the, these letters, uh, you know, they, they take time to, to go through, through all details of the letter of inclusion to understand uh, uh, its content, uh, the, their obligation, and eventually the, the consequences that uh, uh, shortfalls uh, of whereabouts submission may trigger. Thank you. And uh, is the athlete notified when excluded from a testing pool? 
yes, yes, of course. So each time an athlete is excluded, uh, uh, um, uh, an email or uh, or letter of exclusion will be issued to uh, to the athletes, of course. Okay. Let's do one last question from Anna for Stuart. Belarusian athletes cannot receive code via SMS when in, for entering Adams. How can we help them? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure about the particular situation for code of SMS, but there's multiple ways that um, the two-factor authentication can be set up on the phone, not only by SMS, but also there's another code uh, way to do that. My best advice is if you're having difficulties is to send an email to us. Uh, there are two emails that you can uh, contact us by. One would be adams at wada-ama.org or at athletecentral at wada-ama.org. And we have a support team uh, that should be able to help you with that issue. I'm just typing it into AME. Wada, gosh, OK, I think I got it. I think I'm typing it in the chat as I'm speaking. So Thanks, we have Elaine. it here just uh, as a handy reference point. I hope I got it right. Let me know, Stuart. I'll take a look. All right. So. Uh, I We did not get a chance to address all the questions, but uh, once again, you can always contact us. We'll be sure to get back to you with our answers. Uh, if you really have a specific question or something general, either way, feel free to reach out uh, uh, to ITA uh, and to WADA as well. So I think Mikhail is still on the line with us. Uh, we, I'm glad we were able to, to chat and connect even if we didn't see you face to face. So. Thank you very much, Mikel, for your athlete perspective, if you're online. No problem at all. It was an honor, and I'm glad to be able to contribute. Thank you so much. And thank you to our two experts for today, to Stuart and to Matteo, for answering very important questions for the audience. And thank of you. course, Thank you. And of course, thank you to everyone in the audience who was participating, uh, writing comments, and asking questions and staying engaged today and for all five of our webinars. So that, of course, wraps up our series. Uh, we will be in touch with you, uh, as I just mentioned, with more information and other initiatives that we um, are planning for the future. But in the meantime, we encourage you to jump over to all the WADA webinars that are going to be going on in multiple languages um, for the coming months if you want to stay informed and uh, educated. So at this point, I will say one final thank you. Uh, we encourage you to reach out to us, stay connected on the social media channels. And I wish everyone a good rest of the day. Good morning, good evening, wherever in the world you are. Stay safe and uh, we will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.